So I'm sitting in the lobby of the Williamstown Theater Festival with one of the most consummate actresses uh, today in theater and motion pictures and on television. Lila Robbins has abundant accreditation in all three forms of entertainment and she's starring in a new play uh, at the Williamstown Theater Festival, The Chinese Room, by an Irish playwright, no less. His name is Michael West. And Lila, tell us all about The Chinese Room. How did you, this is about your fifth or sixth show, I believe, at Williamstown, right? Yeah, fifth or sixth, yes. So what, what motivated you to be in The Chinese Room here? Well, um, partly I read the play and I was really intrigued by it, but partly I wanted to come back to Williamstown because I haven't been back here in it's either 29 or 30 years. Really? Really? Yeah, I started my career here many moons ago. We can get to that later, I suppose. But The Chinese Room, a uh, fascinating play about memory, about the human mind, about downloading our memories into robots and what that might look like and what the downfalls of that might be and what the upside of that is. And I play Lily. I'm the one who has dementia. Lily the wife. Lily the wife. Of the, uh, but I was one of the scientists with my husband who created these robots. So it's sort of a Frankenstein story in a way that we created these robots and now my brain is disintegrating and we're trying to save my brain and my memory. The husband is valiantly trying to do that. And in some ways it's kind of a love story as well. It's like a Orpheus type love story. Well, I guess I'm having a little problem struggling to, to, I don't know, to blend all of the features here, the name, the, the title, The Chinese Room, yes. written by an Irish playwright. And when I think of Irish culture, I don't necessarily think of high tech, and I don't mm. think of humanoids and uh, yeah. uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, the other thing is a comedy thriller. Well, what's the skinny on all of this? <laughs> Well, it's very funny in the things that do ensue when you've got robots dealing with humans and, some t and whether there are emotions involved or not. We are developing robots and then the more advanced robot might actually have feelings. And how does that complicate the situation? And then what happens when the robot actually takes over? Then how do you deal with it? You've created a monster and can you stop it? So that's partly what's going on there. The, the Irish part of the playwright he said, he set a challenge to himself. He wanted to write a play that took place in America, in Connecticut. And it was sort of a writing challenge to himself to see if he could do that and, and, and actually make the language sound American. And he's been very successful at that. So we I also have you a, know, Brit a, British, a British director. That complicates and it more. One of our actors is Irish. And one of our actresses is Korean, but it has nothing to do with the Chinese word in that case. Well, Did that answer your question? <laughs> I think you're more confused and, now. And to do all of this in 90 plus minutes too, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. But it's, it's very funny. Um, Carson Elrod plays one of the uh, robots and he is a clown. He is a consummate clown and his physical uh, uh, approach to this character is really entertaining. So as part of your role and character, are you somewhat robotic here in the play? No, because no. I'm the one with dementia. I see. I suppose I'm robotic in that sometimes I go blank or I have a glitch, but it's fun to see those parallels between the robots and the human beings and how our glitches might be somewhat similar to the robot's glitches when they do not compute and when a human being does not compute. And what are the, what are the differences and what are the similarities? When the line goes flat, so to speak, Indeed. right? So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm playing a person with dementia, uh, which is hard when you're trying to learn lines. Because I'm actually finding that I'm having a hard time learning the lines because I'm going into this dementia place and I'm losing my memory. And in fact, I didn't realize I was such a method actress. But maybe and convincing the audience that you are in this state of mind, too. That must be extremely challenging or difficult to yeah. do. Yeah, and yet, and, and yet the challenge, I guess, is how do you play that? It's sort of the old thing about when you play a drunk person, you don't want to play drunk, you want to play somebody trying to find the balance. So when you're playing a person with dementia, you don't necessarily want to play I'm lost, you want to play someone 
who's finding connections and finding sense in things. So you would approach it that way. So Lila Robbins, I want you to reminisce for us a little bit about, about Williamstown, Williamstown because when you've been here, I mean, this, this was almost like past generations of uh, theater students here and uh, a, a different period in the theater, it really, was, right? The physical space was completely different. Yep. It's all been renovated, and, and uh, I came up a couple years ago to see a show, so that's the first time I witnessed the, the beauty of the new space. But, you know, I have a soft spot, spot in my heart for the old, the old building as well. I started here with when Nico Sakharopoulos was here, and I was at the, an icon, a legend. Yes, yes. He began it, and he is an amazing human being, and we all miss him terribly. He was so much fun. He had a way of pulling people together. He would promise one actor that the other actor was going to show up for the show, and then the other actor would say, "Okay, I'll do it if so and so do it." He had a way of producing uh, plays and getting everyone in on it. And he gave me my first break when I was at Yale. He was teaching undergraduate at Yale. And I was in the graduate school, and he was looking for someone to play Sasha in Chekhov's Ivanov with opposite Christopher Walken and Diane Weist. And so he auditioned me and invited me to come up here as a non-equity. I didn't have my equity card. And I got the role of Sasha. So I got to work with the great Diane Weist and the great Chris Walken. And there's a couple of stories about Chris. And, and now you're great with <laughs> Diane Weist and Chris Walker. You're, yes, and what you're I, in that fraternity. Oh, of well, I can only hope, so. you know. But Blythe Danner was the leading lady, and I was doing all the ingenues, and little Gwyneth Paltrow was running around here, probably, I don't know, 10 years old or something. Getting in the way. Getting in the way. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. you bother me. Too. Yeah. Should have been nicer to her, I think. Yeah. And so uh, some of the other shows. <gasps> Um, oh, uh, La Ronde by, uh, by um, Schnitzler, um, and Undiscovered Country, and Summer in Smoke by Tennessee Williams. I got to do that with um, Christopher Reeve. That was really a wonderful opportunity for me, a kind of a transition from being an ingenue to being a leading lady with that role. I, I think Chris, uh, Tennessee Williams was from this area, too, I think. Uh, possibly. Yeah. I know that the summer yeah. uh, before I came here, they did a whole Tennessee Williams celebration. Yeah, yeah. Two nights of all little um, excerpts from his plays, and uh, I missed it by that much. I'm, uh, Tennessee Williams is probably my favorite. favorite. So, so comparing your period up here, uh, what, 20, 25 years ago to today? How, how would you... Oh, what, what you're some young of your... and everything's ahead of you, you know, and all of it is to become, and, and romance is the, in the air, and you're up until all hours, and you're, you can't believe... You know, I remember when Nikos gave me the role in Havana, I was sat in my little dorm room and thought, oh, is this my life? Like, I literally, it was a life-changing moment for me, and I'm ever grateful to him for it. And then for the next three years, he, he brought me up here and, and cast me and, and had a wonderful time um, doing the plays, but also singing in the cabarets. We did a lot of that. And, um, and you know, it's baptism by fire. I had this terrible habit as a young actress where if I played that I was in love with somebody, I wanted to touch them a lot in the play, and that's not always appropriate, you know? And Chris Walken <laughs> said to me in rehearsal, Lila, you touch me again. I'm gonna have to hit you. Really? Yes, and he also didn't like the sound of the rain, no, he didn't like the sound of the AC in the theater. So in the middle of a performance, we were in the play, the two of us in the scene, and he heard that sound. And he held up his finger and he, like, I'll be right back. And he walked through an imaginary wall, leaving me alone on stage. He goes up to the stage manager's desk and says, I told you not to turn on that AC. And she said, no, it's the, it's the rain on the roof. That's so he a... came back on stage and I thought, How, you know, what? I didn't know what to do. I was 23 years old. I didn't know what to do on the stage by myself. So you earned your spurs with people I like, did. Baptism like by Christopher Fire Reeve. And Christopher Reeve and Jimmy Naughton and... And uh, oh, when we did Peer Gent up here, I got my equity card. Uh, it was my first, you know, union play. That was a big moment, that getting an equity oh, card. Oh, yeah, I played Solveig in um, Peer, Gint, uh, Peer Gint by, by Ibsen and Dwight Schultz, who was part of the A-Team television show, Dick Cavett, Olympia Dukakis, Diane Venora, Joseph Summer. Um, who else? Who else? Uh, Dylan Baker. All these people were in the show together. And we played it for a week. We rehearsed it for two, and we did it for one. And I, I see on the wall here in the lobby, 
They have the equity players here, of course, yes. your photo is there. And then on the other side of the lobby, they have the non-equity players, mm -hmm. who of course, many of whom are uh, students, uh, maybe they're from Yale or Williams yeah. College or uh, sure. uh, from NYU and places that are great centers of academic scholastic theater, right? Yeah, I mean, so. they, I mean, but this is such a wonderful stepping stone from, from your college education or you're getting your MFA to come here and just be around the professionals and watching them and sitting in on rehearsals and maybe being backstage and helping to build the set and all the apprentices that are here. And it's so much fun because they do all these projects here and then we go and see them which is fun for them too. Well, I'm, I'm sure people working here in the production uh, students during the summer are thrilled to be able to work hand in hand with someone like you, uh, you know, and some of your we colleagues. We're not teaching them so, any bad habits. You know, but, you so know. you <laughs> are an alumnus of the prestigious <laughs> Yale School of Drama, and I'm going to pose the same question to you that I asked of your colleague, uh, actor, thespian James Norton, uh, who was a graduate of uh, Yale. Um, and uh, because a place like Yale or this place or NYU, it, uh, it reflects a lot of sacrifice, commitment, and tremendous uh, dedication to learning your craft. So at that time when you graduated, what were your expectations in terms of your career back then? Oh. And, and then looking back now, you know, the way your career with all of your credits has, has turned out, is it what you had con contemplated? Well, I mean, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I went to the Guthrie Theater, you know, with my parents, and my big dream was to be a repertory theater actress. That was really as big as the dream was, to be a theater actress. And when I went to Yale at that time, they were strictly teaching um, how to be a theatrical actor. We did not have any classes in film, television, none of that. In fact, it was sort of looked down upon. Like if you got out of school and you went into a TV show, it was like, mm, okay, not so much. But of course now, everybody crosses over so much more. And it's more, it's all, all, all the mediums are highly respected. Um, but we weren't taught any of that. So when I started getting opportunities in television and film, I sort of, I thought it was an interesting medium, but I didn't know much about it as far as the training. So I think I kind of learned in my professional life as I went along. But it was also nice to be paid, so that's the good part about that. <laughs> I mean, occasionally the theater actor wants to do a little film and TV just to subsidize their, what I call, habit. <laughs> oh, unless you're in a Hamilton. Of course. Yes, right. then, then you so, probably see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Hamilton is so far removed from reality, right? In terms of you theater. Mean as far as things that yeah. are successful? And, and in terms of theater, uh, the, the commercial uh, end of theater. It's so far removed. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's it, such a phenomenon. And have you seen it? I have not. Oh, it is amazing. And it does live up to all its hype. It really does. It, he's broken the mold. Yeah. He's just broken the mold. It's like, wow. Okay, now how does somebody write a musical? The, the glass ceiling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. It's really powerful. Yeah. So, uh, Lila Robbins graduating, someone graduating today from here, Williams College or Yale School of Drama or NYU, uh, they're armed with their degree in theater uh, or their MFA. Uh, they've, <laughs> made this, like they, they've made this big <laughs> investment, uh, you know, the sacrifice. How would you mentor them? How do you, how do you mentor people here that you're coming oh. into contact with? You know what it is, I mean, and I, I'm grateful to the people that were older than me when I were, was here to say so much of today's society is based on a result or getting somewhere or being famous. We didn't think about that so much back then. We just really wanted to be good actors. We wanted to know how to really do the craft and focus on that and just keep working. And whatever came as rewards was sort of a residual of that, but it wasn't the goal. And I think often with young people, they want to become famous, they want to become rich, they want to... It's really to, to emphasize them getting better at their skill, at their craft, and to look at it like a, sort of like a, 
like a, a you know like a brick mason or a carpenter you've got to learn certain techniques and to focus on that and not get too carried away with stuff and even when things happen for you it's not going to last forever it's the rare occasion when somebody shoots to the top and stays at the top and keeps going at the top whatever that is but if you want to be an actor if you want to consistently work if you want to work in the regional theaters and Maybe someday you'll get a TV show or something, but to keep it more, try to keep it, you know, be more uh, equanimous about it. Don't let the highs get you too high or the lows get you too low. You're a working actor. That's the goal. That should be the goal. Well, I would think a lot of the people around here studying and pursuing this would hope to have the resume one day that you have, right? I mean... So, uh, the, you, you have several new movies uh, in the can, so to speak. I yeah. uh, think there's Island Zero, right? Yes. Uh, I decided to do a horror film. So. This pilot season, I didn't come up with any job, and suddenly I got a call from uh, Tess Gerritsen, who uh, her son Josh directed it. She wrote the TV show Rizzoli and Isles. She's also written about, if I'm not mistaken, 48 medical thriller novels. And, she, and her son makes documentary films about the environment. So together with her son, they put sort of a global warming story together with a monster, with a thriller, and we were up in Maine for a month shooting this film. And it was fun for me because I, I mean, when am I gonna be the pistol pack and mama shooting the monster? Like, that's never gonna happen again. So I had to do it. <laughs> and I also wanted to know what it would be like to be on a set like every day for a month because my, Part was large and I just wanted to give myself that challenge what is it really you know to get up and do that for a month and the circumstances were cold we were in buildings that weren't heated you know they were they were they were tough challenging uh, environments but it was fun we had a lot of fun and I got to be in beautiful Maine for a month so that was nice. well of course the Bella Lugosi's and Boris Karloff's uh, they, did okay. of the, yeah. they made a whole career <laughs> out of horror yeah. films right yeah. so yeah. so and and you uh, recently were in Europe I think shooting another movie right uh, no I wasn't no? shooting a film I was in Latvia actually visiting my uh -huh. parents homeland my parents are both from Latvia and we took my niece and nephew there for the first time and show them our homeland. I That's see. Nice. Yeah. Speaking of homeland, many of our viewers remember you from the hit series Homeland, mm -hmm. uh, where you played Martha Boyd, the ambassador to Pakistan, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, your thoughts on where that series is going, uh, because as you know, there are so many diehard uh -huh. Homeland fans and yeah. uh, with all the twists and turns and new episodes. I don't and, really know where it's going. Yeah. Every year they seem to kind of reboot it and really sort of change the place. I mean, we were lucky enough to shoot in Cape Town, South Africa, which was such a gift. Oh my God, I love being there. It's a beautiful place if you ever get a chance to go. It has whales, it has ocean, it has vineyards, it has mountains. I climbed a lot of mountains. Uh, safari, it's a beautiful place to visit. It's gorgeous. And I was really, really happy to be a part of that show. Um, the writing is incredible, the actors are incredible. I was very, very honored and grateful to be a part of it. I got to be in Cape Town for five and a half months. It was a real adventure. I think one thing that's always fascinated me about actors and actresses is on shooting a series like that, uh, when you shoot scenes, you don't necessarily go in sequence. A lot of I, yeah. that's a big myth to I think yeah. a lot of people who are sitting home watching uh, that that you could be shooting maybe the end of the uh, production uh, at the start, right? Can you give us a yeah, little and sense of that you that, that you can kind of just step into uh, yeah. a scene, right? I mean, when I got to Africa, I, I was under the impression that I had in the script. It's that I had a past relationship with Mandy Patinkin. So I thought, oh, I'm going to have all these scenes with Mandy. Well, I think I had maybe two or three max scenes with Mandy. And about two episodes in, they said, oh, by the way, you have a husband. <laughs> oh, and I said, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. But this happens all the time in television, where you don't always know where it's going to go or what they're going to give you. So suddenly I have a husband. Luckily, the guy playing my husband is a guy I met 30 years ago when I was at Yale, and he was performing at the Long Wharf Theater, Mark Moses. So he walked in, and I was like, oh, my God, Mark, thank God. I've known you for 30 years. I haven't seen you in 30 years, but I know you since 30 years ago. So we already had sort of a history, which was really nice to work with that. And he's a wonderful actor. 
was fun. But quite often, actors and actresses on a set get thrust into situations, uh, right? Uh, uh, yeah, in, um, in uh, the TV series uh, Murder in the First. On which TV. is now I on, play sure. I a uh, defense lawyer, but they also had a, a, a private storyline for me. And in that case, I, I was a woman in a relationship with a woman. And I... Jamie Nelson. Yeah, Jamie Nelson. That was right, who I was, right? right, right yeah. I forgot. Yeah. That's my, okay, good. Um, yeah, and I was in a relationship with a woman. So it was interesting. The lady showed up, and she happened to be married to one of the writers. And, uh, you know, we had to sort of jump into it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, so, Lila, you often get uh, the roles where these people are very uh, intense yeah. or very wound up complex characters. Do you uh, know why that happens? <laughs> what? Can you tell me why? <laughs> so when you take on a Martha Boyd in a Homeland or a Jamie Nelson in Murder mm. in the First, what, what is, how do you develop these characters? What is your analysis? Uh, how do you turn yourself into them? Uh, well, and how, I, how deep does that go? Well, with Martha Boyd um, being the ambassador of Pakistan, I interviewed a couple of uh, ambassadors. But more than knowing, I, I wanted to know what their daily life was as far as their work, but I also wanted to know what their lives were like outside of work. What, what was their private life like? like? How much time do you have? Do you really have any? They, they are working 24-7, literally. Um, because there's all the dinners after work, and then there's this, and then you've got to entertain that person. And often their private lives suffer because of that. And if they have a partner, that partner goes with them to that country. So I wanted to know more about the private life of Martha Boyd. And then all the, the sort of uh, professional stuff. Um, Alex Ganza gave me a couple of books to read about Pakistan and how complicated the situation is. And I can't say that I understood everything about pa Pakistan, you know. I mean, it's like playing a doctor on TV. You don't literally have to be a doctor, but it's good to know a few things. So that's kind of at my level of, of um, knowledge about something like that. Um, and the and this development triggers your emotions. These this research and knowledge about uh, the character. You know what triggers, triggers my emotions more is the is the script and the scenes mm -hmm. that I actually have to play. You know, if it's if it's a scene with my husband, um, it's not that different. Maybe from just being a professional woman in my own life, you know? I try to bring as much of myself to it, especially when it's television and film, because the camera comes in so closely that, that to make a real character shift, I don't know, I, I wanted to work as much from myself as possible. I thought, you know, I could be a defense attorney, I could be, could I be an ambassador? Maybe, if I had gone a different way at school, you know? So that person is not that different, perhaps, from me in some ways. So how do I bring myself to it? Yeah. And then what are the things I have to reach for as far as who I am in that particular piece? Do you have times where you, you're given a character and a role and you feel conflicted that maybe uh, it should be uh, played this way or that way or different from what the expectation is? Uh, is there that debate or argument uh. or is that pretty much the province of the director. But I would imagine that someone in your position uh, gets a certain amount of license with the director, right? Yeah, but you kind of want to be, you want to be pleasing them as well. So I mean, having meetings with the writer, having, talking it out with the director, say, hey, are we on the same page? And usually it would work out in a, in a case like that. The challenge right now I have with my the character that I'm playing in the Chinese, the Chinese room. room at Williamstown. Yeah, is that I'm playing a woman with, with dementia, but I was a really super smart scientist that invented these robots. So then how do you play somebody who's super smart but losing her mind? So that's been the conundrum for me. And where do, where do the brains that were there before show? And where does the childlike lost person show? And where does the person who's trying to make sense of it like a scientist show? You know, these sort of aspects, it's kind of, I get to kind of come at her from different angles. Because she's just not the smart person. She's a smart person losing her mind. What does that look like? That's a challenge, so it's been fun. Oh. In our few remaining minutes, Lila Robbins, one of my favorite movies, which was actually, I believe, your very first movie. 
uh, was when you played Steve Martin's wife in Planes and Trains and Automobiles. Yeah. Very funny film. Yeah. And uh, the first first film, was that an it exciting... It was my first Hollywood film. Okay. I had done a film in Mexico with Terry Kitty and Kevin Anderson um, before that, but uh, this was my first Hollywood movie. No, and that was, was an, a milestone, an exciting... Yeah, and John so. Hughes and working with John Candy. You know, in the film, I'm at home waiting for them to come home, so I didn't have all that much uh, time with them, but they were both really, really lovely. John Candy's a sweetheart. Steve Martin was really nice. I... I it was a little baptism by fire, you know, I got thrown on the set with, okay, these are your kids, and then you do the scene, you know, without really even developing a relationship with those children or what that is. So you're, you're often with film, you're kind of just tossed into a situation and you have to have done a lot of homework before you show up. Well, so Lila Robbins, another film I remember that you did uh, in your career was An Innocent Man, which where you starred with... Tom Selleck, who yeah. of course has uh, been on Blue Bloods for many years yes. now, and F. Murray Abraham, who's yes. a big uh, alumnus up here of uh, the uh, Williamstown Theater Festival, and uh, uh, that was uh, and, uh, cops and uh, yeah. cops and uh, <laughs> yeah. private eye type yeah. movie, right? Yeah. So, uh, an innocent I think it man. Was, uh, yeah, I'm sure. I was, it, uh, was it the first? Tom had done some com comedic films before that, but I'm not sure if he'd done a, a, a kind of a dramatic film before that time. Yeah. But he was mostly known for Magnum P.I. Yeah. Um, and he, he was wonderful. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Yates was the director, lovely Englishman, lovely director. Yeah, we shot that in Long Beach, California. Uh, once again, you know, there was a real learning curve for me. Um, I'm just grateful that all those people gave me a chance at the beginning because I didn't know what I was doing. So I want to close our interview, uh, Lila, with some uh, photos uh, from uh, the Williamstown Theatre Festival play that you're in, mm -hmm. uh, The Chinese Room. And uh, what do you have uh, coming up, Lila? Do you see this play maybe going to off-Broadway or yeah. Broadway? Yeah, there could be a chance for that. I think that's partly... Um, what Mandy Greenfield and her uh, artistic directorship is sort of uh, really focusing on is new work here at Williamstown. And, uh, you know, we've rehearsed them for three weeks and we put them up for 10 days. It's a very small window where perhaps some producers can come up and take a look at it and see if it has the legs to move. And I guess we'll find that out you know, later. Well, for the past several years, there's generally been two productions up here that wind up in. New York City. So, oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know yeah. So, uh, uh, I would bet money on the, 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 the Chinese room. room with Lila Robbins. Oh, so, that's nice. so, and Lila, thank you very much uh, for uh, being my guest uh, Thanks, on uh, uh, our nice show here you. on GNAT TV. Yeah. Thank you.